Good morning. I call this meeting of the Municipal Airport Authority of the City of Fargo to order on Tuesday, August 27th, 8 a.m. Roll call, please. Rashana. Pleased to be here. Burke. Here. Cosgar. Here. Excellent. Here. Here. Uh, approve the minutes of the regular <coughs> meeting held August 13, 2024. So, there second. is a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Uh, approve indiv individual vouchers A through J. So moved. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, number two. Approve the airport vouchers totaling 202,854.21. So moved. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, discussion. Hearing none, roll call. Prashani? Yes. Aye. 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 Okay, now approve individual vouchers A through J. I'll move for that again. There's a motion second. and a second discussion. Hearing none, roll call, please. Prashani? Yes. Aye. 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 Okay, four, receive July financial statements. He's here in person all the way from Grafton, so thanks for coming. Yeah, like I was telling you guys before, I show up every now and then just so you know that I'm I'm still real. Um, I think I'm going to ask you if you're a Grafton officer. Yep. <laughs> That's good and bad, so don't ask me names. <laughs> you want to set that on the furniture? Yeah, I can. Um, so what I did was, what's up on your screen and what you guys have in front of you is just a little bit of a different version of, um, of the budget and the actuals and everything like that. Because I know you guys have been asking for... Um, you know, how do we know if we're ahead of budget? How do we know where we're at? And so this is just going to be up the screen, but look at your sheets, please. Because what I did was I went through um, and kind of redid the budget. We had a lot of things just broken out over 12 months. Everything was broken out 12 months. So I went through all of the income. And if somebody paid for their hangar rentals in January, I, I adjusted the budget so everything looks a little bit clearer to you. Um, it didn't adjust the budget numbers. It just adjusted the, the months and what the budget numbers were due. So really what happens is... Um, I'm going to share Absolutely. this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Um, on the first page, everything in that columns to the right or to the left of the blue, that is just showing the actuals in January through July versus the budget's actual through July. The year to date is where I really take a look at, and that is in the blue. So this first page is basically all revenue. So if I sit and look at every column in the blue, um, the first one I have highlighted in yellow, that should technically be blue, green. That is, everything in green is basically what is great and what is way ahead of budget. And we know that the interest revenue is way ahead of budget, and it's up by about a half a million. We also know that the Fargo Jet Center is up about 24000 this year versus our current budget. And then if we flip the page, some other outstanding things on the budget in the green are the car rentals. The car rental percentages are really sitting good this year. Um, so far, the car rentals are up about 20%, and the parking is up about 2%. And so when I look at the revenues and even when I look at the expenses, I'm looking at the blue column. And everything in the blue column, there are very little reds in the revenue, which tells me we're doing very well budgeting-wise. Um, currently, we're tracking about 722000 higher than last year, or higher than budget, sorry. So we're at about 8.77%. Um, so we're about 100000 higher than budget every month is how we've been sitting. 
So with five months left in the year, we have about 35% of our budget left to meet. So it shows we're sitting really well. If we keep flipping through the next pages, you're going to get to the yeah. expense. <laughs> yeah. But on the blue, we've got over under budget, kind of budget. Remaining if negative, then more revenue than budget. Is that assuming through the end of the year? Is that what you're saying yes. in that column? Yep. You're saying based on what we've learned through July, here's where we'll be at the end of the year. Yep. So basically, we're, we only have 35% of our budget left to meet for the year. So we're sitting at seven months, and we've met over 65% of our budget. So I feel we're sitting in a very good place for revenue. All right. So if I look at that just on the final page where you have total income, you're estimating that we have almost $5 million. In, right. We'll call it net operating income. Yep, that is what we're we're assuming. And as you, we flip through it, I know um, the next, like, page four, we start getting to the expenses. And when I look in that blue column, everything is in red, which is nice to see because that just basically shows that every expense is basically less than budget. Um, one of the big expenses that is less than budget is the airport salaries. That's at about $215,000 less. And we know, we know the answer for that. Um, some of the things in the expenses that are over budget, we had some snow removal equipment we purchased. We had a vehicle. Um, we had higher in chemical just due to weather. And so even with those going slightly over budget, everything else has been tracking under budget. So it's nice to see for our expenses, we're tracking about $350,000 lower than budget. So we're at about 56% of our budget after seven months. Um, so I think we're in a very good place as far as the year is sitting. I know you kind of wanted to true up that budgeting and get things more in place, average out when things were coming, truly coming due and when things, the income was really coming in. Um, and so I did that and it did change the number slightly and it was to our favor. So where we're sitting in the operating account for 2024, I have no concerns with at that time. Um, it didn't do anything like this for the parking or for the construction account, just because right now it's, it's, we can budget a number, but it's all we know based on grants and timing of, um, construction and things like that. But just if we want to take a quick look at that, um, to get our two charts up there as we have looked before, we have shown, let me see if I can share that. Um, if we take a look at the construction accounts for our terminal and our parking, based on the latest cash flow projections, um, if we estimate our terminal, if we estimate that we're going to get 50% of the discretionary competitive grants that are out there, we're still going to need about $60 million. And if we, I'm sorry, that was 75%. If we estimate that we're getting 50% of those grants, we're going to need about $78 million. So that is something that we continue to closely track and monitor the timing. <coughs> of the construction as well as the timing of the grants. Anna, on this budget, 25 budget, what did you use as a percentage, 50 or 75%? We are using what McGow and Stroh have given us for the timing of their invoices coming in is what we have used for that. And the grants are kind of hit or miss, so we basically just use the grants that we feel we will be awarded in that year. Um, but in terms of the other projects we're doing, did you have a percentage base on those grants? Let me understand the parking ramp and the terminal. But as far, <coughs> there would be no other grants then. So all the grants right now are tied to the terminal and tied to the park. The Bank of North Dakota loan is tied to the parking. Um, 
Any of the other grants out there right now are tied to the terminal, the apron rehab, the glycol. They're all tied to those projects right now that go through 2027. And we're using what we perceive to be that percentage for each one of those. Right. We, some of those are guaranteed. We know what those are. We know what that relationship is. Right. And some of those are guaranteed funds. And for the funds that are discretionary competitive, we're using between that 50 and 75% <coughs> to judge the cash flow, although we're hopeful that we get more than that. Right. Um, I did have Tana, a one, oh, Go ahead. A little further on that. The capital projects beyond the terminal, the ones you named, are there any other capital projects that you're using the uh, Leibowitz and Hort <coughs> input output model? I thought that had also the 10 year capital projects. Yep, and we do have, um, I'm actually meeting with Sean and stuff after the meeting, and we're going to go through and update those projects. But we have met before, and there are other projects out there like the South GA, the North GA. Um, the pavement and lighting or the electrical, all of those are out there right now that we're still building as so a forecast. We, we have expenses for those. Do we have grants matched up to those? <clears throat> no, not right now. We do not. So we're just the, using... The, that's one I don't know how we deal with because some of those larger projects, if we don't receive the grants, we aren't going to do the project, but we have the project in our cash flow. Without the grants, we get a really skewed position. I don't know how to deal with that. Well, and do you that's, have any ideas? Well, and that's why we have the cash forecast plan, because we can count the timing of the grant cash inflows that are coming in, and then we can leverage how we use our cash reserves. <clears throat> So right now we're using cash reserves to pay for those projects. We also are paying out of our pocket pocket for some of the terminal costs and things, but then Sean had just signed some grants that had been approved, so we're getting reimbursed for those. So we are trying to have all of the grants matched up with the terminal, and then we leverage the cash reserves to pay for the projects that are out there right now. But help me on the... On, uh on the analysis, if we have a $10 million project that we're expecting to be 90% grant funded, and that's in our cash flows, so we're, we're accounting for that. But if we don't get the 90% grant, we aren't gonna do that project until we do. So we've, we've, <laughs> we've incurred the expense, but we haven't. You know, how, how, how do we match up to what isn't grant funded in some of the capital projects? How do we? So right now, we're those discretionary and competitive grants. Yeah. We're playing worst case scenario. We're saying if there's a $20 million discretionary grant out there, we're saying we're only getting 10. Our right. forecast only says that we're getting 10. Correct. So we can play it out how we can work with the cash to still do that project with $10 million. And if we get the full $20 million, great. Um, <coughs> those projects are based on the timing of construction. So if I know that we might be pushing back one, and that will adjust the cash flow. But, but that is why Sean is looking at it all the time and Maiden Hunt to determine where is – the cash flow based on the invoices and the timing of each project. And so we look at that. I know that's not a very clear answer, but yeah. we look at that every couple of weeks to make sure that the projects that are going on can still stay funded. Do we have a standalone on the parking garage and the terminal? Just because the, the confusion comes in when you get into the, the Leibowitz and Horton input output model. Because that, that's the one that, that's kind of hard to follow. You don't, there are projects in there that, if they are not grant funded, will not start. But we're still accounting for them in our cash flows. Correct. We are. And we look at that if, 
So say in 2026, we know we are going to come into about a 32 million cash flow deficit. Right. And so that is what I'm going to sit and talk to Sean about today is what are some of these projects that are planned? Are they still proceeded to go ahead? Do we have funding sources for them? Are we putting them on hold and pushing them out a year? And that's the delta I'm trying to understand. Because we're making decisions today based on our cash flows that we're looking at that somehow I, it, it, it's almost, if we don't receive a grant, it could be to the benefit of the cash flow the overall. If we don't receive the grant? Right, because then that project's going to come out of there and those funds that were identified for that are available for others. Well, each grant is written for a particular project and has a certain thing. I'm, I'm so. talking the match side of it. We're counting for our match side when we're looking at the grants. You kind of lost me. I'm sorry. Well, let's just say we have a $10 million project, 90% grant funded. So we have to account for our 100000 match against the 900000 yeah in the grant or nine million, whatever it is. If that project isn't grant funded, then we free up the cash that we've identified to do the match. Correct. And then that project would be that project on hold if we do not get that grant unless we look at other alternative sources so, of funding. You know, we're, we're making decisions on money that we, if we don't receive a grant, we'll have extra money from that. And those projects would go on hold, correct, Sean? That's how it works every year. And we just had our CIP. No, no, I, I understand how it works every year. I'm just trying to, as we go through and we're making decisions on this, that you know, how are we trying to manage to that? You say every two weeks you're adjusting. Well, and we do. Every time we get the invoices for all of the construction projects, we plug them into the forecast. So we're working with actual numbers and forecast out. Yep. Um, every time a grant is guaranteed, we change that to 100% from the 50% once it's approved. And so right now we, we do have projects that are tied to those grants. And if those grants do not come in, those projects would be put on hold at whatever phase yeah. They and are, that cash would become back available. And then that cash, our percentage of that cash still sits in our cash reserves. Well, and, and and that's why when I saw in your budget that you're using the Leibowitz and Horton input, I want to know. We talked about should we be looking at standalone for the parking garage and the terminal so we're tracking that project. <clears throat> and that's exactly what we're doing. So the graph that's up there right now um, – it's a little hard to see, but I'll move this up here. So the left one right now would be that red line is the total cost of the project, which is about $157.58 million. If we just got the grants that we know we're going to get, we're going to... We're at forty-six million for the grants we're going to get, which would leave us a shortage of one hundred and twelve million. We know that is not the case. The right side is the very best case scenario where we get absolutely everything we are asking for in every discretionary and competitive grant. If that were the case, we would need forty-three additional million dollars for the terminal. Um, the I should mention the. The $40 million from the state is also built into there. So if that state money comes back higher than the $40 million, that would change that. Um, if we go down to this one on the left, this one right here is, what if we only got 75% of the money we're asking for? We would need $60 million additional dollars. And the right side is if we got 50% of what we're asking for, we would need 78 million. So we are tracking it by terminal, by parking, by other projects. So right now, the way the parking sits, the parking is actually a pretty straightforward deal because it's a $40 million Bank of North Dakota loan. And right now the costs are at 42 
2.4 million. So we know that extra 2.4 million is going to come out of our cash reserves to fund the rest of the parking. The one on the right side right here, this is the one I look at and this is the one we talk about. These are all of the other little projects that are going on. And all of those little projects leave us at about 14 million short of doing those projects where we need to find funding for. And so those are the projects we look at and determine if we should stop them, push them down the road a couple of years, what we should do with them. And those are the projects right there that if there is no money, those projects will not happen until there is money. But we do have them on the forecast right now. And it's my hope after this meeting, after I meet with everybody, we know that the CIP goes out to 2038. But I'm going to work to try and get a cash forecast out to 2030. So we have it out because 2027 is not out far enough. We need a forecast at least out to 2030. So we're working with a good five year span. So hopefully by the next board meeting, I can have that built out to 2030. So we can see what our long term lookout is after the terminal and the parking are done. Because we do have some big projects coming up, and, and these two projects aren't going to be the end of it. There's projects just as big as this with just as high, high of cost. And so because of this, um, like I said, I know at this point, come like quarter two of 2026, the way it sits right now, we are going to need between... 32 and $40 million of a cash inflow for the big projects to work. And so I have met with First International Bank and Baker Tilly, and we've talked about a line of credit and bonding. First International Bank is not in favor of the line of credit for 30 or $40 million. They would do a smaller amount. Um, but what might work is after talking with Baker Tilly is if Baker Tilly could guarantee that a line of credit could roll over into revenue bonds after so many years, First International Bank might be for giving us a large line of credit, knowing that the guarantee is that it will be off their plate in a set number of years and go to revenue bonds. So that's something Would we're the bank in North Dakota offer a guarantee on the line of credit? We don't have that information yet from the Bank of North Dakota. I think we could, there are so, banks that, that would work with Bank of North Dakota. So if the Bank of North Dakota comes out with a nice project or a nice loan with the interest rates like they got for the parking, yes, we would sure look into that. But right now it's not an option. I'm just wondering if, if they'd participate. So if any of the banks would, you know, they'd all have a different appetite. <laughs> They do a participation at 60, 70 percent on the line of credit. So it's something I can check into. I haven't had any conversations with anybody from Bank North Dakota, but I know that the loan with the nice rig we got for the parking is not available right now unless they come out with something in the next year or two. Well, no, I, I think it's more their traditional uh, participation program. That, so. And I can sure look into that. Further discussion? Are we just receiving this? Yep. yep. Are, can we, tell you, are we going to talk separately about the budget? Or? Yeah, I think that's the next item on the agenda. Okay. All right. Mr. Motion to. Do we have to have a motion on this? Yes. Okay, I move to receive them. Okay. Motion to receive. Is there a second? Second. There's no just been made and second and roll call, please. Hold on. One question. What do you need? I need to know. Are you confident that this is this is running true to the year that what we're seeing here is, is going to continue? There's no big timing issues that are gonna increase expenses or revenues drop offs. So. Correct. I went through and I compared the revenue trend and expense trend from last year to this year. 
and kind of made changes in the budget, not the overall budget numbers, but the timing of the budget okay, so and the, updated those. So, so the, the, well, we'll talk about it, the assumptions on the, on the next item. So, yeah, I feel much better about what you have in front of you now that we've kind of tweaked everything and brought everything in line with the monthly timing of it. Yep. Okay, there's a motion and second on the floor. Roll call, please. Yes, Johnny Burke. All right. All right. All right. Number five, continued discussion regarding approval of the 2025 budget. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, Open employee health insurance and stuff. Mr. Chairman, I think we've got an easy one down here. Oh, would you mind if we moved or I'd, I'd move that we take number nine? Okay. Proposed site plan for the South EGA. Next on the agenda. Any objection? Okay, we'll take number nine and approve revised site plan proposed South GA by Dell. I think, Mr. Chairman, we had a uh, good discussion with uh, Sean and Jeff and uh, Dell and the people that are building this. And I just, I think what they came up with, I don't know if we can put that up there. I think that would be helpful. Um, I think one of the issues last time really had to do with what do we do with what's left over? So I think that next page shows the site plan. Oh, okay. You want that one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, right there. So I think what what they came back with was really uh, good for us. It fully utilizes that site. And there's actually an updated site plan that has a longer, narrower holding pond. I got that one, too. I can switch Yeah, let's do that. that. That's the most there. recent. Yeah, so let's go back to the other one. But you can see that. Yeah, okay, we can just go back to the other one. Okay, I'll zoom in on this one. <clears throat> well, I think the other one's easy to read. I just want to show that that holding. There's a holding pond right there. Right. Then go back to the one you just, that one, yeah. So, again, I just from the standpoint, is there the holding pond's different, but it fully utilizes the site. The buildings come out and they square up with the existing building. And uh, apparently there's like 11 acres of drains into this area. So I think we've solved that. The, uh, the other thing that they did is really put some time and effort into the flow. So they have fuel tanks. You see fuel tank trucks there for really how they can get in and out with semis. And I think there's probably some still some tweaking there. But uh, I would, I mean, I would move that we approve the site plan, Mr. Chairman. Second. Okay. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Motion been made and seconded. Uh, call roll for this one to Mr. Chairman. Oh, Mr. Chairman. Nope. <coughs> I do have a question. Uh, on installing additional fuel farms on the airport, I think there's some historic knowledge uh, that we want to look into, and I would appreciate if the authority would. Uh, go back and if, if you don't have it with you today to research on that before you approve this, that uh, the authority, <clears throat> excuse me, years ago put in a, a fuel loop road in the north part of the airport that was designated as fuel storage facility. Um, and if there's additional fuel uh, storage going to be offered, especially of this size at the airport, that I would appreciate the authority looking into what was previously decided by your board, by the authority on where those might lie. It, it essentially said that you built it for future expansion. The road is designed to handle spill and all of that. Um, and future fuel farms were designated to go in that area. So I would appreciate you get that information in front of you before you would approve any fuel farms on the airport. Love the, love the expansion of air hangers. I'm all for it. But fuel storage is a different volume. There was discussion of centralizing the fuel tank locations in the north and the south GA. Uh, so anything in the north GA would go in that general area. In the south GA, Jim, that's full now. With the addition of the 12,000 square foot tank that Dave is working on getting operational, there's no more room for additional tanks in that designated south area. So the only option would be, would be to expand that to a different location. So it, it's full. That's the rationale for what you see here. And I can go back in the minutes. Jordan and I will search for previous discussions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think this is an area that the board ought to take a look at um, because we have all kinds of different fuel things going on. We have some people with their own underground tanks, other people with tanks. We have two fuel farms. 
I just think lack of having a, a uh, <coughs> standard for the airport makes it very difficult for people to build. When people are putting a huge hangar in, we should they should know kind of up front what that is. So, I mean, I think if uh, to kind of move this along, because I think it's critical, uh, I think we can, you know, vote on this. We're not voting on allowing them to have fuel, but we're showing kind of what they want to do. And then I would, I would maybe in whole business, we could kind of, not a task force, but, you know, we could dig into that a little bit more so we have a clear standard. I mean, I just, from my perspective, Mr. Chairman and committee members, if someone's building a hangar of this size, they should have access to fuel. That, that's kind of my thinking, because that's one of the major expenses for aviation. And I think the Jet Center does a great job. And I think we have another, you know, uh, Dave Saul, who's here, all has a limited uh, fuel <coughs> license. But I, I do think it would be good for us to set a standard. So, so with that, Mr. Chair, I guess I'd ask, can we, can we approve this and then address that later? Yeah, we're just approving the site plan right now, not necessarily the fuel farm. And there's Chairman. Sean, I do recall when the North GA was, was being developed, there, there was discussions back and forth. <coughs> do we have any history of what we kind of set up there, promised there? Yeah, we'll, we'll search uh, the minutes, and I didn't have time this morning to, to pull out. I just recall that there, there there were some some things that were supposed to happen. The south end was supposed to kind of be phased out, and the north end. No, it wasn't phased out. It was because this. Yeah, that was a big misnomer on the airfield. The bad rumor that started. The reason the North GA was created because was because there was limited space for hangars right. in the South GA. So working with the FAA and the state, we created the North GA. Wasn't that was going to be closed? There was a rumor thirteen thirty one was going to be closed. That, that was all. No, I'm just saying it, it, it would help to go back and see that history. It is through the minutes or, or whatever the discussion. Was. Paper, I mean that that that's what we need. Is. So well, you have basically three fuel farms on the field. The one that Fargo Jet Center purchased from Northwest Airlines over here. There's a South GA fuel farm uh, that has tanks with Group Six, Dave Saul, and then Fargo Air Inc., which is a group of private aircraft owners that are in, in that tank that Lilux takes care of, it's Avgas. Uh, you have an underground tank with shots up in the North GA, and then you have Jim's fuel farm uh, up in the North GA. That's all and, and I'm just trying to recall what, what, what was said, what was promised, what was. Well, said, was, 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 I think we ought to have a discussion about what our plan is for fuel. Yeah. The other thing is I think that we need to spend some time in our, what I'll call our long-term plan for development here. I think that's one of the things that kind of happened is we had a different plan on hangers. I think this is better, but it would be good to it'd be good for us to be able to say, okay, if some business wants to build a hangar, we can say, here's where we'd like you to build the hangers. But, so I think unless there's any other objection, I think we can take a motion or act on this motion. Right. And there's there is a motion and a second on the floor for um, approving the site plan. Uh, roll call. Yes. Aye. 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 Okay. Number five. Continue discussion regarding the approval of the 2025 budget. Pam is here with a couple decisions that we hope you can make today. One is uh, the share of the employee health insurance. We have to let uh, our um, for public health insurance group uh, know on September 6th what the employee share will be. Uh, we talked about uh, Dr. Bashani's uh, suggestion that the airport authority picking up 100% of the health insurance cost, or what's in the budget is just to keep it the same as it has been for the past, um, I guess, two years. That, that, that's one. And that's insurance. Um, cost of living, um, there's a information that we provided to you from Megan at Pro Resources. Um, you can kind of see the ranges that some of the political subdivisions are, are discussing. Fargo, 3.5 to 4.5 percent. City of West Fargo proposed 4 percent. Cass County, 2.5 to 3 percent on top of the 3 percent <coughs> schedule. Fargo Park District, 4.5 percent increase. Uh, West Fargo Park District, 4.2 percent. And then the SU through the biennium, the budget that was uh, shows a 4% increase for 2025. 
Uh, she tried to find out as much about health insurance as she could as far as employee employer share. A number of the cities and counties still didn't have their um, increase. Wayne Rindlinger said that the city is looking at a 15 to 19 percent increase, but they don't they won't know that until probably October, where their health insurance will sit. So cost of living in the budget was 3%. That was based on discussions with the city back in May, June, when they were looking at a 25 to 3% cost of living. Now those have increased as others have come in around the area. So um, like Tana had said before, we could put in the higher amount. Um, we've tended to, to follow what the city does in the COLA, but that's up to you. So Mr. Chairman, Sean, there's really two issues. <coughs> One issue would be what do we do on the COLA? The second would be what do we do on the health care? And then, and then the uh, those are the two issues that need to be decided. Then the longevity pay. and the longevity pay. Mr. Chairman, I think could we first <coughs> to do this when we were looking at July? Let's look at the assumptions on the budget so we have our baseline numbers and we know we're working from Santana. If you could bring up uh, our assumption page on the budget. The 2025 budget, I do not have the assumptions for. We just took exactly what Sean had the, the, provided. There, there was a narrative in, in the packet here that, that gave percentage uh, increases. Right, and those are what <laughs> we use going forward. But when we got the 2025 budget, we hard-coded those numbers in and then used our assumptions going out. Okay, well, let's look at those assumptions first. Because yep. that, that's what drives our whole budget. <coughs> okay, let me see how quick I can. You're back online now. I am. <laughs> All right, so that is our budget, but you were looking at what our assumptions. Yeah, were. your budget assumptions. There's about five or six key assumptions there. <clears throat> So those are the assumptions that we have in the, oh, I'm not sharing the right screen, of course. So these are the assumptions that we have, but they are not for like healthcare or anything. When we put in assumptions, we're putting them in for um, employments. That health there. We put them in for employments, the airline revenue growth, um, and then we just figure costs for employing passengers. Um, we have the interest rate steady at 5% for 2025, I think is how we calculated it for Sean, well, did we? It was one of the three options Natalie no. had. We picked the 3%. The point. 3%, okay. And you had a summary um, page in there that just had uh, seven or eight key assumptions. Um, which page that was on. It's probably the next one. Because again, I think when we see we're running over a half million ahead in interest for this year, we set our interest for our budget next year at a 3% growth. We set our cost of financing at a 5% growth. Cost of financing would be the uh, the rate on a municipal bond, which is what we would be investing some of our surplus in. So those two should, you know, follow one another. The three seems low. 
the five may be appropriate. And then uh, when we see our rents growing again in 2024, um, I'm not real comfortable with some of these. So what's our automatic escalator in our rents? We, we build one end to each lease we sign. The next one that the board approved was going to 18 cents for all of the private hangers on the airfield in 2025. Mm -hmm. And we have an escalator clause in there. Really. There was no decision by the board to, to make an escalator clause for that. There are escalator clauses in the, there's one here today for the cargo. In, uh, well, are we comfortable when we look back over the last couple of years, our <laughs> rental fee, um, can't quite read that, it's 2%. Rental free uh, fee increase. We've been running stronger than that. Yeah, that's because uh, we've increased from 12 to 15 to 18. That was the, the board decision to go. If it wasn't 8 and 10 cents per square foot, then it went to 12, 15, and 18. 15 this year and 18 next year. So we'll just do in looking at yeah. looking at the 24 uh, year to date and anticipated year end. Uh, some of these, I think, were a little light on. But these assumptions were not necessarily in the 2025 budget numbers. Sean had did those numbers based on his own calculations as well. We just have this plugged in going forward past 2025. So there was a 3% COLA well, assumption. Then before we approve the budget, we should know what our uh, assumptions are for the provided those to you when the budget came out there was a three percent cold no, I, but but it, it's a little misleading when you had in here this table and now you're telling me that's not the budget but but it's part of the budget package these assumptions are not part of the budget package the budget is what sean had figured out for his assumptions for 2025 based on the current trend he was seeing. These are the assumptions we have going forward. So when we do like the income statement and when we build it out um, past like through 2027 or build out the balance okay. sheet well, for 2027. Yeah, maybe then what we can do is take that table and put what was used for 25 so we can see what the percentage uh, changes are. Because I mean, I, everybody gets excited, uh, but uh, with the budget, when you you know you exceed revenue and you you uh, are under expenses, but cash flow is so critical through this whole process. Now we need to <coughs> hone in and, and know what that is. Um, so that's why I was looking at these assumptions. Well, I, mean, Chairman, I think that's probably the miscommunications here. We want to approve a 2025 budget, but the question is, what are the assumptions that the board should be aware of that we're making? We talk about health care, we talk about COLA, and so I mean, I'm assuming, I'll go print them out again. I mean, it was provided before. I'll come over. Okay. Um, you want to um, discuss the health insurance? Sure. I mean, I think those are the two issues, health insurance and COLA on top of this. And I understand right now we've always had the the employee a single had a co-pay of about $60. In the family plan, there was a co-pay of about 300 So that was my understanding. I think that's what was in the budget. I mean, if... if uh, and if you're looking for a motion, I would make a motion to that effect. Okay. Um, I would move that we keep the same health care <coughs> share as we've got now. Okay, there's a motion on the floor, and we're just talking health insurance now. Yep. Uh, motion on the floor to keep the health insurance uh, the same as it has been as far as the uh, um, Cost per employee share type participation. Is there a second? A second. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, roll call, please. Can we have a little discussion? No. Discussion. Um, <coughs> I had, had asked Sean to, to look at full coverage 
terms of our competitive position against competing employers, one being literally across the street from us. Um, I, I'm a little anxious about separating healthcare from COLA. Uh, my, my ultimate goal would be us maintaining a position of being competitive, not a superior competitor in terms of attracting us to people working here. I realize that's my my perception. Others might not agree with it. Um, if, if we're going to maintain the COLA, then I'd encourage us to be uh, more generous. I mean, uh, the healthcare more generous on the COLA side. I'd like to see us not be followers. I'd like to see us be leaders in maintaining employees. Others, like I say, I respect could have a very different position on that. Um, but I'm, I'm, it makes me a little nervous to talk about health care separate from the overall package, with all due respect. Sure. Well, Mr. Chairman, my thinking, I totally agree that's part of the whole package. My thinking would be to, to make a motion that we do a COLA at like 4.5%. Uh, this motion. Call it four and a half. Right. That's not part of this motion, but I think we should discuss both these at the same time. Uh, if that was the case, I'd be totally comfortable. Okay, there is a motion and a second on the floor for health insurance to have, <coughs> have to remain. Um, both, well, I have to wait till Sean comes back. He's looking for something, right? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, um, do you know what the what the Cass County we're, you're proposing a two and a half percent cola? Two and a half percent okay. cola. And the city, we're not sure on that one yet. We're not sure. We'll, we'll city see. hasn't cut up there. It'll they be. They can't a, make a decision yet. My guess is it'll be no less than three and a half. Okay. And as much as four and a half. Okay. Some more, but it's not decided at this point. And, and that's where I come from. My position is if the city's not going to be more than four and a half, if we're four and a half, we're in a competitive position, even if they max out. Not presuming, but I'm not holding my breath on that being four and a half, which would put us in the slightly superior position to that one entity. We could, we could actually, I could withdraw that motion if we want to go back to this. And Wherever you want, Mr. Chairman. Is that okay? Withdraw your second? That's fine. The motion is, that was made and second have been withdrawn. <coughs> this is what we'll write back to you in July. This is what you were looking for. Two percent cola and ten percent increase in health insurance actually came in at three point nine seven. Uh, Sean, I, I maybe I'm confusing you here, but uh, Tana, if you go back to the, the, the budget revenue assumption, that's what I'm looking at. That, uh, there was what, a separate document for that. Unless I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to. This document right here. This was part of our board package with the budget, which we're now being told was not used for the 2025 budget, correct? That is correct. Because that, that, when I was looking at that, that's a little deceptive because we're looking at the 2025 budget, but those are not the assumptions that are used. The assumptions are used to advance the balance sheet out to 2027. So 2024 is actuals. The budget Sean has developed and we have locked those numbers into the budget in this program. And then the assumptions are used going forward. Right. And so what I'm saying is how are we comparing 2024, we know it's coming in high on revenue and low on expenses. The 2025 assumptions for revenue and expenses, what are those percentages versus what they've been in 24 using to develop 25? What, what is used in the 2025 budget is what Sean has printed out. Right. But what I'm looking for is that comparison in the percentage change from 24 to 25 and what we're projecting. 
I don't know if that's something that you have, Tanner, or not. Well, I mean, it's critical here that, that we, if we see a revenue item has increased by 5% in 24 from oh, our 23 can. budget, and then we're saying, but in 25, we think that's only going to increase 2%, we should understand why. Well, I can tell you, if we look at this in the report that I, that was handed out at the beginning, this compares 2023 to 2024 through July. Okay. So here it is an increase of 28,000 in the hangers. So the hangers have increased 5%. Okay. I don't know. And so that's what I'm asking. Are we using 5%, 6%, 2%? in projecting from 24 to 25 what hanger rent's going to be. I what? think for the hangers, Sean had said it was going from going 15 cents a square foot 18, to 18 cents. So it'll be a cents. similar raise in 2025. And again, you're using dollars. I want to be able to look and say, here, here, here's the assumption. In 24, from 23 to 24, we have a 10% increase in a night. Now, we're projecting 25, okay? So if we say we're going to increase 24 by 3.5%, knowing that it was 10% in the prior year, we're really missing our mark on the budget. And so that's what I'm trying to see here. And, and that's why this is so deceptive. Because you have percentages going from 25 out. You have just dollar amounts going from 24 to 25. You know, and remember, when we look at uh, this year, we're going to be almost $2 million over budget in that income, correct? Now, is that $2 million into the cash flow on that? It'll go into the cash reserves. Well, it's going into cash reserves, but is it going into the cash flow analysis as we look at yes. our gap to the end? Yes. So. Yep, that money becomes available for capital projects. So that, projects. that's new money into the, the whole thing beyond what we had budgeted um, for year end. And so this is this is really critical that, that we accurately project what we're doing. Because on the hangar rental, the ones that are on there are fixed. We know exactly what they're going to pay. The ones that we don't are like Fargo Jet Center's FBO amount, the fuel flowage fee and the percent and a half. Um, that was increased, uh, of, you know, just based on what their growth was. I ch chatted with Jim and, and uh, Randy Jensen about that. Then you have the fuel flowage fee for shots, the fuel flowage fee for Fargo Air Inc., and then also for Group 6. Otherwise, the other ones that are on there are fixed. We know exactly what they're going to well, pay. And, and again, Sean, I, I appreciate all that. understand what you're looking for is the percentage. What, what we're, we're looking for is the percentages, so, so it makes sense to us. together and have it for you at the next meeting then. You, you've got to have a consistency to it. We, we consistently underestimate revenue or overestimate revenue and underestimate expenses. And, and I think we need to get more accurate. And to do that, we've got to look at, at, at what our assumptions are. They drive everything else that we're going to do. Any further discussion? Um, well, I guess the question would be, I think, to build the 25 budget, we're making some decisions on what those assumptions are what we want to be in that budget. Yep. And I think two of the ones that I was, I mean, there's there's others here that I think we're not looking for huge effort, but what's our budget expecting the interest rate return for next year? 3%. What's that? 3%. Okay, so that's the first time I've heard that. And I think what, what we're saying here is like, you had 10 different assumptions there. What are the assumptions for 2025? Just so we, so it's more transparent what those are. But I, that's not my point. My point is the two things that I think we talked about here in a few meetings was the health insurance and the COLA. And so I think maybe it would be helpful if we as a committee made a decision on those two items now. <clears throat> so then that's kind of known for that budget. So I guess what I would do, Mr. Chairman, is I would maybe we deal with the COLA first. Uh, my, my intent would be to continue the life or the, the health insurance the way we have with, with the employees paying portion of it. But I'd, I'd move that we do a COLA at 4.5%. Do I mean, 
What's that? You want to combine them? And then yeah, you can... I guess I'd make a motion that we do a COLA at four and a half percent and continue our insurance uh, at the, uh, I'm not sure exactly what you call it, but a quote, employee share. And how about the longevity pay adjustment? That I don't know anything about. So what is it? Let me make the, let, let's give us a background on that. Sean. <clears throat> so longevity pay is if you're here for uh, 10 years, then each employee gets uh, so much per yeah. month. So it's at per five. Month. The city changed it recently, and after five years, you get $25 a month, and then it goes up every five years. But the city now is saying at five years, they want to increase that 25 to 50. So the total um, uh, increase for our budget is about $5,000. We're kind of breaking with the city at this point, if we're going to do the four and a half. Well, I think city I think policy. Well, oh. I think it's good to break with the city and do the <laughs> thing. I'm uh, so so. My question is, what is what is in the budget for longevity pay right now? What what are we proposing, or what's staff proposing for 2025? The line item. It's not a lot. It's just like I think currently it's eighteen thousand. Yeah, it's a little under eighteen thousand dollars a year. So this would add five thousand, like one five thousand one hundred twenty dollars or something like that. It would go from twenty five to fifty dollars in this budget for that particular longevity pay. Eighteen to zero six total, but it's every five years. There's there's a, a bump in. Yeah, I understand that. We're increasing in this budget. We're increasing that amount from twenty five to fifty. Correct. Okay, so that's kind of if I. That's the change in this budget over prior budgets. Yeah. The total is five thousand. One hundred some dollars. But I understand that, but again, it's just, and we're doing that because the city is doing that. Well, we've as, tried to mirror them as closely as we could. No, I understand that. I didn't mean that in a negative sense. Mm -hmm. I'm just so as a package, and I'm not concerned about mirroring the city. I'm concerned about our workforce. And so, I, if I'm hearing Rick right, what he's saying as a package would be four point five for cola. 50 for longevity and holding health. Yeah, I'd make that more. Actually, 25 for each five year increment. That's 20, an additional 25 for each. Right. Mr. Chairman, the, the, in our packet there, Joan Newton included um, her turnover percentages for 22 to 23, I believe. They were what? 24 and 18 percent. Yeah. yeah. What? What are? We, what are we measuring there? Is that? Is that? Uh, resignations or is it retirements? Who are they? Who are they? And it, that was is the it just percentage for turnover? That's what we were asked for. So it's retirement and uh, resignation. Correct. Do we have a? Could we look and see what that is? What you know, if it's if it's twenty five retirements and one resignation, that's different than if it's the other way. If it's twenty five resignations and one retirement, um, and then could we do year to date twenty four? Because we're seeing the rapidly change. It would help to know if we're seeing a turnover in a certain class of employees. Heavy equipment operators position has those wages have gone sky high, so maybe we should be looking spe specifically if there's certain areas that we're saying that. And I appreciate the, the overall percentage, but it'd be helpful to, to dial into those. Yeah, I remember saying that. So here it was 2022 was 24 percent, 2023 was 18 percent. Yeah, and it just what's it made up of if that's both retirements and resignations? Provided that, have we been told to provide that? No, we will. So we'll get that together for you. What was provided is what was asked for. Well, I think, Mr. Chairman, the big picture we want to know what's going on with our workforce kind of ahead of time. Do we need to beef them up dramatically? How do we compete? How do we do that? So I think. 
obviously we've kind of followed the city, done different things, but I think going into this next cycle a year from now, we should really be evaluating, you know, what do we need to do to be competitive? So uh, in 24 was a highly inflationary year. So I think year to date 24 would really be helpful at this point also. Okay, I believe there's still a motion on the floor to keep health insurance the same. And COLA was 4%? Four percent. Four and a half. Four point five percent. And longevity pay. We'd add twenty-five dollars. Twenty. That was twenty-five. Okay. And I believe there is also a second to that. Second. I bow up. I think I'll remember who it was. Was but it I'll you, John? Call for no. I'll call I'll for a second to that motion. Second. <coughs> Motion's been made and second. Roll call, please. Shawnee. Yes. Bird. Aye. Cosby. Aye. Beckman. Aye. Aye. Okay. Receive updates from TL Store Architects regarding their parking structure. Mr. Chairman, just, just before we leave, Sean, so you're clear. Are you clear on what we're looking for on the 25 budget? Yep. Tana's got you're, notes, so we'll, we'll you're clear on it because you just said we didn't tell you what to do yep. last time. So I just want to make it perfect. Okay. Percentage increase in each Mr. over the years. Yep. Yep. Well, we have <coughs> kind of three vote points today. Um, and you're not getting an increase in pay. And I'm not getting an increase in pay. Uh, <coughs> we're pretty much on schedule with, uh, with uh, the parking structure. We used a couple of our um, rain days that are built into the into the, um, the schedule that Madoff did. So um, we had 28 uh, weather days and we used two just recently with all the rain that we had. We're, so we're still, but we're still right on track. Um, uh, finished piles in September and the uh, rest in October. So pretty excited to, to see that happen. Um, the other thing that we've been doing is uh, between Jeff and McGuff uh, and myself, we've been talking about the additional road <clears throat> and the necessity of having that before we start the um, Skyway. Um, and part of that is if, if you looked out there and saw some of these machines that are doing these uh, hill piers, they're quite big. And we end up having to have some of those uh, in, in supporting the Skyway. Uh, and so they're going to take some significant um, real estate up at the, you know, right the middle of the airport at some point. So we feel like we have to have that road in um, for sure before we start that. So. I, I guess I'm just trying to give you a heads up from the standpoint of more than likely the, the parking lot is going to be completed and and the Skyway will not be uh, for a little while. <coughs> and so people are just going to be coming down to the main floor and crossing, you know, uh, uh, across the street. So for a while. Um, and then uh, the other thing is I, I think Greg's, are you coming up to? Yeah. So there, we have a interesting new development in um, parking technology that we want to run past. Yeah. <laughs> Very much so. Appreciate it, Terry. Glad to see everybody again. I uh, had a chance to chat with most of you coming in about the ballet product. So it's off to a great start. Just to give you a quick update on that. Uh, some surprises we've seen already is the fact that people are wanting to park for even less than a day. Um, just to kind of come in and have a bite to eat with the person they're dropping off. So we'll keep an eye on that and just kind of monitor that throughout and see if we need to make any adjustments with pricing and so forth along the way. But um, so far, it's been uh, well received. As the message gets out, we're, we're excited about that. But to speak to Terry's point, um, obviously, we were acquired by Metropolis back in May of this year. And part of that, we became a technology company overnight. And so one of the things we're excited about is the fact that we control our own fate with respect to parking equipment, how to get in and out of parking lots and so forth. One of the things we've noticed quite for quite some time being a parking operator for, for many years is that the challenge is how do you get in this lot compared to that lot? You know, certain lots you put a credit card in, you got to use that same card to get out. Certain lots you pull a ticket, all these different methods of getting in and getting out of a parking lot. So timing's perfect with you building this new garage of the technology that we have with respects to just drive up to the gate, gate recognizes your vehicle, gate arm goes up, you park, 
It calculates the time that you're there. You get to the exit, you know, it goes up and charges your car that you put on file. Mm -hmm. So that's like a membership type thing. Um, the first time you do it, you, you, you're done. You don't have to do it again. You have a lot of repeat travel here. So the next time you come, you're, you're just a member now. And if you don't want to be a member, you don't have to be a member. We're not forcing you to. You can check out as a guest each time you come. Um, but obviously, we encourage you to do so just for the ease of the experience. Um, so it just was perfect timing with this new garage going up to have a system like that, which no one would have parked in the garage in the first place. So everybody's new to the garage, right? Um, and if you choose not to join, you just scan a QR code, simply put your card on file, and you can still exit the same way. Um, we can still accept cash. We have tablets, mobility specialist personnel that will be on site that can come out and accept your, your payment via cash and then just validate your parking state. Similar to how you get validated when you come here uh, for your board meetings. Um, so essentially, it's, it's the same process in that sense, but it it's also adds an operational efficiency to the operation. We capture plates now because part of the seven pictures that it captures is your license plate as well. Um, but it doesn't just rely on your license plates because we know everybody has personalized plates, stackable plates, all types of different plates. It really learns your vehicle. So it's a form of artificial intelligence in the sense of I know the vehicle, I match it up, and now I know who to charge accordingly. Your receipt is uh, emailed or text to you. And so now you have that record if you need to do your, your reconciliation and uh, expense reports at a later date. So. I wanted to share that with you. The, the biggest wow factor is there is no CapEx. So I know we had some uh, plans to budget for some uh, different options in this project that required a <coughs> front end cost, if you will. This is only an OPEX cost. It's like a monthly SaaS fee and then uh, also a transaction fee that's passed on to the consumer. So happy to get you more pricing, give you a formal demo, if you will, if interested, but just kind of want to break the ice and engage your interest. Uh, we're excited about it. We see airports transitioning and gravitate to this as we uh, show it to them, just because it's, it's something new, but something not new in, in general terms, just <coughs> new airports, if you will. Gregor, I was looking at their website, the Metropolis website, that they indicated $15 per month per spot is what their fee was. So it's like that's like fifteen thousand a month or one hundred seventy-five thousand per year, and even that's capped at four hundred spaces. It's capped at four hundred spaces. That's in the commercial space, okay. and so the model in aviation is a little different. But you're one hundred percent correct. Fifteen dollars per space, and that's capped at four hundred spaces. You're saying that the customer pays that. The SAS fee is paid by the airport. Okay. The <laughs> transaction fee, which anywhere is from ninety-nine to one ninety-nine, is paid by the. By the consumer. So six thousand a month or seventy-two thousand a year is what our cost would be to have that technology. That's versus saving. I don't know if Joe or you guys remember how much was in the GMT for flash for equipment. Was it eight hundred grand? Um, yeah, I can pull up the exact number, um, but the, I don't know if it's been. We we're not quite the contract with them. There's a bunch of insurance stuff that you probably don't care about, but so we haven't technically paid them anything. But all of the parking equipment is in stock in Texas right now, so it's, it hasn't been shipped here. Obviously, we don't have ramp to put it in, um, so I'd have to do some more research on where it's at and how much work they've done. Sure. Go away. One more addition, additional item. Um, it would put you in a position over time, and when you're comfortable with to obviously scale back which this is a management agreement, we converted right around the time of the pandemic um, from a reverse management to a management agreement um, from a staffing standpoint. So it kind of competes with those difficulties in getting staff and things like that, just because again, everybody's paying, uh, most people will start paying with, with a card and, and with cash. But even if not, you're gonna save in your RM costs because all of that's included in that SAS fee. Um, so there's no maintenance calls to make a bill to get you know sent to you that says this camera went out. It's it's one hundred percent our responsibility as part of that as well. So that's all included in that. So there's optic savings along the way. Sure. Greg, how much? How, how what percentage is paying cash right now? Currently, yeah. I mean, you're I, in the nineties. Um, Ninety percent are card. Yeah. Oh okay. yeah. All right. And. Uh, the new technology, I'm excited about it. It's great. What's the default 
situation when the technology doesn't work. And so that's the when beauty. does the gate go up? Well, that's the beauty just... of it. We can set it up however you or you're comfortable. Because honestly, the technology was initially developed with no gates. Um, and the intent was to not keep you trapped in a lot of right. use the word trap. Um, but with a gate environment, we could set it up to where, hey, I'm not communicating right now. I can't process it right now. Gate arm still goes up. Well, I'll I mean, it, to process it, just, it. It, it seems like when, when there's a problem, all of a sudden you got 30, 40 cars in line. And that's why you have control of that now. You can say, okay, hey, Greg. You can just put the gate up and continue to try to process the transaction. You might get back home <clears> while the person's driving home. Yeah. So now it charged my car once I got on the interstate. Right. So, so the so gate goes the up and comes down. You take the picture, but you yeah, still check it. The person has no idea the system is not communicating. Yeah. Something <coughs> a back awesome. the line. Well, yeah, because um, it really because you are trapped it. once you those cars start right. backing up. Oh, do that. It's, it's really it's, pisses it's off. Pretty, pretty That's, bad I, I'm sure. I think this is a great idea, Greg. Thanks for getting us on the leading edge of that. Uh, are we going to have multiple exits coming out of the ramp? So, so really I mean, I just I envision I envision one exit would be this membership exit where people are just shooting through. Is that possible? Yeah, and so if you just did the garage, that's exactly how it would work. You can take that far lane, the third lane, and say, okay, this is, if you want to call it the membership exit. Right. Right? So we're going to have three exit lanes. The, the long-term light of state with flash. You can continue to use your flash equipment. To <laughs> um, so this will be the gate. Band-aid off and do Excuse everything. me, this, this will be the exit gate that we have right now. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that, that same plaza will be leveraged. It's just a matter of which lots that you want to use this on. And it'll know which lot you want into as you've gone into those different lots. Someone goes into the parking ramp, they know you've gone in there, you have this membership, you zip right in there. When you depart at the far end of the parking lot, they know you were in the ramp and you're built appropriately. That's correct. And, and that's where that overhead signage will help with the electronic signs. We can tell you and, and through weight binding of which way to go. Mr. Chair, um, Joe, is some of the eight, is the eight hundred thousand dollars in equipment is that portion uh, is part of that? Like when you drive in and they say there's three or you know there's thirty spots on level three and there's or when you drive down and you can kind of look at the and you can say oh there's a red X or you know how many spots are available on each level? Yeah, you won't have that full system, but as you drive up the speed ramp up to level two there's a counter so yes it ties into that okay so because are you saying that some of that equipment then isn't needed so we'll so no, there'll the county, be a savings for us from the 800 but we'll still have like the counters and that type of thing yeah that that still will be necessary <laughs> this is mainly just for revenue control if you will you know, governing who got in how did you get in and then how did you get out of it for your state but if you're counting spaces that's still so do we have a ballpark on how much money we'll be saving i could put together full-fledged you know this is what this would cost and we could do it side by side <clears throat> yeah depending on how far down the road they are with, with what's what's being it, proposed it kind of like the toll roads from here to frisco texas you come through they don't have anybody in the toll booth anymore it's just you pay the toll, they take a picture of your car, and you get a bill in the mail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The only difference is with this, I mean, you literally just get an email with the receipt. Uh, you already paid, assuming the system's up at the time that you exit. That's the only time that you might have a little delay, but it's, it's, it's seamless. And again, as the, the network continues to grow, <laughs> you can say, hey, I recognize that lot. I'm already a subscriber, if you will. I just drive in and drive out. And you, there's no more learning curve, right? right? I know how to drive up to the gate, pause for three seconds, drive in, exit the same way, pause for three seconds, drive out. Sounds good. Just one little yeah. trivia question. I'm intrigued by people using the valet for just to drop off and sure. walk in. What are they being charged for that, the full day price? It's just the daily price right and now. And people are doing that. Because we only we actually have one location where we have incremental pricing, like up to six hours. Um, and it's just one of those locations where a lot of people just come to the restaurant free security, yeah. grab a bite. And so we did it there. So we didn't really think there was a need to do it here or anywhere else we launched ballet. But literally yesterday, <laughs> yeah, it was like 50-50. It was like 50% was just wanting to come in, 
and grab a bite to eat. And they didn't even walk at it. And I explained it to them. I said, hey, there is another option. I want to be very transparent. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to order ballet. It would be good for uh, our board meetings to use ballet. (laughs) That is my report. (laughs) Thanks, Greg. Thank you. So, Mr. Chair, um, just one more question for Joe. So, um, when we've been talking about the the windscreens and just wondering if that could help to fund like the windscreens or you know if we have a substantial cloud saving yeah, certainly. equipment. Yeah, I would I would need to do a lot more research on <clears throat> what we have. We don't have any drawings on it right now, so I don't know if there'd be any crossover between what Flash needs to provide. Like we would need to understand what Flash would still be providing and how it ties to the new system, what the actual deduct is, and then it certainly can be applied to however you want to use the money. Okay, just curious. Yep. <clears throat> I always like to say money. <laughs> Okay. Uh, any other further discussion? Not. We'll move on. Receive update from Eden Hunt regarding passenger <coughs> expansion and modification project. Brandon. Hey. Good morning, everybody. Um, things are moving uh, moving right along. They uh, did have a, a, a few challenges with uh, with rain on on the terminal, but they've uh, worked around that and working to gain ground. Um, their exterior foundations uh, should be done by the end of the week, except for the uh, far east end where they're gonna maintain access into the interior of the building. Um, precast is uh, scheduled to start September 3rd. Uh, we uh, visited the site. Uh, I think it was last week, visited the precast plant just to uh, check out the the progress and the panels. So that's exciting. Those are are being fabricated as we speak. And then steel uh, steel erection will be uh, ready and beginning uh, towards middle or end of September, about September 18th. Um, As far as uh, uh, scope is concerned, we we are st- working on the order of magnitude uh, pricing uh, for the baggage claim improvements that we were looking at. Uh, those are now uh, in McGoff's hands, and they're they're evaluating that. I think they're anticipating on getting just some budget pricing together uh, next by next week. Uh, so we should have that by the next uh, next meeting, along with the uh, uh, along with the furniture, uh, the double armrest uh, furniture option. So just knowing those are those are going on in the background. Um, and then for the uh, brand branding signage wayfinding facilitation, uh, just that I received proposals from the consultants late last week. I'm working through some of the uh, uh, some of the details um, and uh, specifically with Flint's role. Uh, and including that, and we'll have something uh, something to share by the by the uh, September 10th meeting. Any any questions regarding the terminal? Any questions? Further discussion? If not, I guess. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. We'll move on to number eight. Approve the Fifth Amendment to ground lease for <coughs> MDC Fargo LLC and FedEx and ground rental rate increase. It's for the lease agreement with MDC, which is Midwest Development Construction. They own and lease the FedEx facilities. The lease now uh, into the point where it's due for an increase. Uh, so it is the max. It's five cents uh, per square foot, equals to 25 to 30 percent, which is our commercial rate. The next opportunity is I think it's every five years for adjustments. So I think we need to approve the ground rental rate increase, which is effective. So Motion. Uh, second. Motion has been made and second in discussion. Hearing none, for roll call, please. Yes. Aye. 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 Number 10, receive update regarding preliminary site options for possible hotel. Tom Shower. Well, Tom or me. Uh, so at this point, um, so Tom's done the site planning, but uh, as we're moving into uh, more specifics on the hotel, 
it, it starts falling into uh, kind of a, kind of the vertical construction realm uh, beyond just site planning. So uh, I'm, I'm going to just share my screen here if I could, Darren. Should work. All right, that work? You guys see see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right. So this should look familiar. Uh, these are the three locations that we've been evaluating. Um, and after our review, uh, I, the uh, existing and currently awarded utilities, uh, all three hotel sites are are viable, um, but. <sighs> But all right, so all all three facility all three locations are viable. But uh, however, to do a more detailed evaluation of probable costs, pros and cons, and a more detailed study will 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 be needed to gather input uh, from like as you know from potential hotel developers uh, evaluating the utility size requirements. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, evaluating these with with some of the airport tenants. So we're uh, respectfully asking the board if they would like to, and we put the kind of summarize the three options in there. Um, holding off the utility installation until spring. So for further this further study that we described could take place. Um, holding that off. Uh, we, we spoke with uh, McGough on what we think that would cost, about 150 to 200,000. Um, this this would cover the construction and and design study costs. And then there uh, there's a possibility of just some schedule impacts uh, if if we were to have a late spring. Uh, what's included in those costs are uh, the in in order to keep this uh, keep the addition moving. They would be uh, anticipating to use like ground thawing equipment. So, uh, so in the in the early spring, they could uh, thaw up the ground and uh, start putting in uh, some of these utilities. Uh, they, uh, as far as like water, uh, water service on that end of the building. And then what I'm showing you here is just a glimpse of just the storm water. Uh, as you can see here, uh, not not to. <laughs> Uh, make you dizzy, but one of the locations that we're looking at is is here, the the for for the hotel. Um, and if we look at the site plan, you can see there's a lot of storm uh, storm drain uh, uh, running through all of, uh, this location. Um, so if if the hotel were to go there, we would we would want to make a point to redesign the parking lot and. Uh, and the storm drainage so that uh, you're not putting it in and then tearing it out uh, a, a year later whenever this hotel would would take place. Um, so that that's kind of what the 150 to 200,000 is covering. Uh, the second option is to move ahead and reconfigure the parking and uh, utilities based on the footprint uh, of this. Uh, this location, if this is the location you'd like to move forward with. Um, so in that case, uh, we're, our, our team would uh, run through and redesign around this footprint uh, of right now. Um, and we would work with McGuff on, uh, on expediting that. Uh, we're anticipating about 15,000 for, uh, for in design fees to, to redesign that site plan and utilities. Uh, and then in order to generate a construction cost impact uh, of, of what that would cost, we would have to uh, go through design and have an, an iteration to share with, uh, with, to share with McGough. Um, and then the third option, uh, we can proceed uh, as we have it planned and in currently, uh, uh, currently in the budget, and that would be no cost impact. So, uh, we wanted to make sure that you had options. You didn't feel like you're uh, backed into a corner here. We, we do have no cost option, but our recommendation just uh, this 
this is this is coming up fast. Uh, and if you're serious about um, the hotel in the next few years, uh, or, or if you have some interested parties, um, then we would recommend uh, holding off on the utility installation until spring and really take a good look at this. So uh, we've, we're, we're asking for the board to make a decision on which option uh, of these three uh, they would like to move forward with, just so we can keep McGough moving in the right direction. Rick, Mr. Chairman, so uh, you've just talked about, I'll call this B. What about A, option A? I mean, I know yeah. does the same amount of cost apply to option A? Um, yes, the only thing with option A, and you're referring to the purple one? Correct. Right. Right. Yeah, uh, the difference with that is is you're not affecting construction, so we can move ahead uh, on the study. Um, but if 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 you were to choose option three, uh, proceed as the current plan, we and we can still move ahead with the study. It's just uh, one of the major cons of uh, of this location would be that you would be paying for rework. Uh, and, and the utilities. Mr. Chairman, just to be clear, so a little bit confusing for me, but I think you said option one was to do a plan for 150,000. Option two was to just redesign it. And option three is to do nothing. And so I guess what, what I think we need is we need to, at the end of your construction, we need to have utilities to that site that I'll call site B. So they can just build and plug in to utilities. So I guess my question is, you said that would be a $15,000 redesign. If we made a decision today that, yes, we wanna keep B as a viable hotel option, go ahead and get that infrastructure in there now rather than waiting till spring. Am I hearing that correctly? Yeah, yeah, you're right on, Rick. So it Rick, seems Rick, Rick, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, Brandon, correct me if I'm wrong. The 150,000, where that comes from, is a small portion of that is a planning study. The rest of it is the additional cost to get the utilities in in the spring, where they'd have to do some ground ground thawing ahead of time. So that 150,000 isn't a study in the in the largest amount. That's the additional rework for the delay of putting in storm sewer water and uh, wastewater in this year, there would be a delay until we figured out exactly where everything should go with the rework. Well, it seems to me, Mr. Chairman, that we shouldn't delay that. I mean, we should design it and plug it into our current flow now, or, or we can wait until next summer before we do it. I don't think we need to be doing it for the hotel in the middle of winter. That's that's my concern. I, I I'd rather put the money into infrastructure than studying and you know keeping the ground thought. Well, what we were recommending, Rick, is that because of some of the uncertainties in the size of utilities, that we need to make sure we analyze to make sure that we can get appropriate water and wastewater and storm sewer in and out of the uh, uh, hotel, in whether it's the site east or west. We'd still have to analyze those. If we go forward, and our recommendation was is hold off on McGough having those installed this fall, where we quick go and set up a, a quick set of meetings with possible developers, do the analysis on the utilities, and so that in the spring, you guys have an option somewhere in the winter to say, okay, here's what we're going to do. This is the location we're going to put it in. Here's the additional cost because there will be utility cost regardless. So we just need to make sure that you guys have the appropriate numbers and information to make that decision with all the background. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's, we're spending $200 million on this project. It seems to me that the engineering part of this could be done a lot quicker so we're not starting and stopping on utilities. So I guess that's my question. How long would it take to have this redesign done so we know what needs to be done? Yeah. Well, and and that's gonna that that will depend on if we the the parking lot layout. Like, it, I mean, this storm drain, as you can see, the storm drain layout um, 
a lot of it has to do with pitch and grading yeah. of, of the parking lot. So uh, if if we come up with a concept and uh, and and it's approved by the board, I think that's that would be the most uh, this is this most streamlined approach would be we come up with a concept, it's good, and we can move forward with uh, with with McGuff putting together uh, pricing and get that alteration <coughs> so they can get this done yet this fall because it's it's getting time critical. So, Chairman, you're you're assuming that we've already selected the site because you keep going on that on the. Uh, East side there is the site. Right. That, I think on the study we're talking about, we would evaluate both studies and both sides and the utilities associated with both. Okay. But but, but sure, the if we pick a site, you don't have to do that. I mean, yeah. I think right. I think right. My opinion, we do two things, Tom. One is either we say, okay, let's hurry up and let's get utilities to where the where our hotel site is. We know it could be a little larger, a little smaller, or whatever, but we do that um, if we pick that. Or we do, you know, we do nothing and just say, forget that second site. We'll go to the first site on the west side of the building. So I guess that's from my perspective. If if there's a desire to do that, that B site, um, uh, yeah. I mean, the underground can be figured out, I would think, fairly quickly. We don't want to duplicate things, nor nor do we want to necessarily duplicate studies on both sites and delay this thing further. So I don't know if this hotel concept is going to be a year from now, two years from now, five years or 10 years from now, but I think we should anticipate when we're doing all this underground, there needs to be a site there. And if something has to change, you know, so be it, but let's, uh, let's uh, plan ahead for that. So what do you what decision do you need from us? I guess that's my question, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Tom? Guess from, from from my position, I guess what I'm seeing is is you either have a decision to if if you're gonna go and I'll say east side or west side, and or if you want to hold off for a quick analysis where we would do look at the utilities, and again, each each side has to look at those utilities. As we went over last meeting, we talked about both east and west and the pros and cons from an operational standpoint, not the technical design standpoint. The west side, for the most part, has an impact to the rental car parking, and that would require that to be pushed a little further away. The east side has a little further walkway to the terminal building, but roughly the same to, this, to the ticket encounter as both sides. Um, those are the two conditions that are, are really if if you want us to take one of those and run with it or if you want us to stop like in one of the cases on this when we got done last meeting McGough had already put in an order for the uh, install of the utilities so those are being planned and, and ordered already so if we keep moving with that we're gonna have to come up with a quick design to reconfigure that on the fly to and see what there is for additional um, rework just for the limited amount of redesign that goes into that wastewater, sewer, and water. Rick, um, what if we just identify the site and make it part of the RFP that the developer, here's the points where you can hook up to utilities yeah. and include it in your proposal and let them get their own architect engineers and well, take my care of it. So there's two parts. One, I think most developers would say, or most people are going to build a hotel, say we need electricity and services to our lot. Yep. They take it but I, I think the last thing you mentioned, Tom, I think I'd really appreciate if you do that. You know, we're going to meet in two weeks again. So I think, I think, you know, do the engineering you need to do to keep that site B as a viable option with as limited future infrastructure as possible. <coughs> so I guess I would I would make that motion, Mr. Chairman, is that they we request that Need and Hunt do the engineering for this option B and work with McGough on what needs to be done <coughs> in the infrastructure as they're doing this. Okay. There's a motion. Is there a second? A second. Yeah. Motion's been made and seconded. Discussion. 
Hearing none. Is there any, Jeff, any questions? I, I guess <clears throat> I just want to clear. We're still we're still impacted by that, which is totally fine. We can we can do whatever you guys decide. But the impact is we're at a hard stop for utilities. So if they we the goal is to get those utilities in what I call the armpit of the building in this fall, so that next spring when we're installing glass, metal panels, all those things. Um, we're not driving over utilities, but we're having big trenching excavations. So to counter that, the, the 150K, that the price tag was for us to get ground thaw out there in February and March to get those utilities in. I'm, I'm saying this should be part of utilities this fall. That's what I'm saying. But a redesign will be up against it. I, know, I don't I think. know you'll be up against it. Okay. I'm just saying that, you know, again, part of my frustration, we've been looking at this for four months, right? And I know these things take tremendous amount of time so i'd like to come back and if you are saying the check so we don't need to do the utilities for the hotel in the middle of winter i mean we could do it two years from now but i think you need to look at the underground and say okay if at some point there's a hotel here then here's what we're going to do we're going to cap these off we're going to change this around so it's easier in the future we're not having to dig everything up and then the goal is to still install utilities this fall. Or well, I'm saying you guys figure it out. Okay. And, and look at it, and you'll know what's possible and what's not possible, and then we can make a decision. Okay. <clears throat> it, it may not be used yeah. if there isn't a developer that wants to. We may never ever build a hotel there. But what I, what I'm I trying to get, what I'm thinking, Rick, is that um, we we put that all to the as you said the developer saying here's here's where existing connections to infrastructure is you give us your bid yeah we could do that in the future yeah. absolutely but we want to minimize that cost in the current construction we're doing and we'll, they would have their own engineers yeah yeah and yeah, we'd have to do more at that point yeah okay. There's been a motion second. Do you understand what he's talking about? Yep. Okay. Makes him mad, but <laughs> roll call, please. <laughs> Shani. Yes. Hi. Hi. Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, let's see. Mr. Chair. No. Could we just, is uh, Brandon still on? Yeah. yeah. Brandon, could you stay on until we do, uh, for when we do uh, item number 12? Sure. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. Okay. Uh, receive update from Governance Committee. Dr. Berg and Dr. Bassani. <coughs> go for it. <laughs> I was going to tell you to go. I think, I think uh, you've got that in your packet. I don't know if anyone had a chance to look through it, but I think at the, the bottom line is, um, you know, we recommend that we move forward with this. Um, I think maybe a motion might be to uh, get a get a um, a more formal contract. Uh, yeah, get a contract with Jeff Schultz um, or shots. I mean, so I think I would move that we now let's make the motion. We can talk about it a little bit, but I would move that we um, request a uh, contract proposal from Mr. Schatz. Second. Motion to name second in discussion. Um, you know, in my discussion with Mr. Schatz, he, uh, I think what he's proposing is, is the next step towards the governance model. And crucial to all that is buy in by both the board and administration. And so I think if I, I'm in favor of going forward with the step, but uh, we, we also have to have. A, a commitment and dedication to the process that be it the Carver model or whatever model is being proposed. And that's gonna that's gonna require us to do some some unique things. And we've already had discussions and different models with committees. The committees he's proposing have been opposed, saying it's gonna be a problem with uh, open meetings, open records, but that as we approach this, we have to approach it with the the mindset of we're going to do this, let's make it happen, not why we can't make it happen. And because uh, otherwise, I think we're wasting our money if, if, if you know we're looking for reasons not to make this happen uh, 
or we don't have buy-in by all the parties. It, it's you know, not worth the effort. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree, Mr. Chairman. I mean, going forward, we'd have staff us willing to make this work. Otherwise, it's just a waste of everyone's time. So I think that's part of what this motion is, is for us as a board to say, yeah, in good faith, we're going to go forward and try this. Oh, Dean, you have any comments? Completely agree. And this isn't them or us. It's, well, me or them. No. It's us. No. All will have to make some changes. Are there good changes? <clears throat> okay. Any further discussion? If not, I'm going to call, have a roll call on this, too. Sean? Yes. Aye. 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 And we'll move page 1 <coughs> to request the proposal. Well, I think yeah, you should. Okay. OK. Item 12, receive and approve request from the Arts Partnership. This would be the third year, I think, of the partnership that we've had with them. Where they arrange for all of the uh, musicians and other ones that come out to the airport to perform uh, throughout the year. Um, it's been a great uh, partnership. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback, not only from the tenants here, but from the general public, um, social media, and otherwise. Um, it's been good investment for us. So I recommend it's 6,500 for the third consecutive year of their partnership to coordinate the live musicians that are here and then also the ongoing art display that's in the, currently in the baggage claim, knowing that things are going to change in 2026, but for 2025, there really isn't anything that's changing. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, Brandon? Yeah. Hey, Thanks. do you have an update on um, getting Ivy on board? And I feel like um, we want to be cohesive in our in our plan, and we have a great uh, relationship with the arts partnership. Um, but I'm so when we look at this, it's a specific like for art and for music, um, like the rotating art display. Um, I'm I'm wondering if um, this if we if we're making decisions. Uh, presumptively, you know, before we have Ivy's uh, like umbrella type of participation or guidance, and and I know that Tanya would like to work with Ivy, or she's expressed that. So I, I, I'm just concerned that we're saying this is for X, Y, and Z instead of maybe just keeping it open. Maybe I'm wondering if maybe we should table this until we have a more a, a plan with with Ivy to to speak with Tanya about how we spend that money sure sure yeah I and Ivy and I uh, just spoke last week uh, and and uh, clarifying what what her scope is one of the th one of the exercises is going to be also establishing a budget for what that artwork is going to be for the airport that would be the point in which we would have Tanya involved as well as we're looking at the the, the opportunities to uh, display artwork and saying um, making sure that we uh, we have those spots filled. In other words, um, Ivy would identify the ones that she would be putting uh, you know responsible for placing artwork, and then we'd also have areas that that Tanya felt that she could. Uh, she could populate as well. So that would be part of the coordination effort. Like one thing I'm thinking is, um, you know, maybe maybe $6,500 goes towards purchasing art instead of just rotating art or and the labor. And, and I don't know, because yeah. I would love to have Ivy be a part of that conversation. Yeah, I yeah, and, and I'm sure Ivy would like to be part of that conversation too, because that kind of touches on uh, Part of uh, some of our discussion that we had last week, and it, I know we've talked to Tanya about procuring art um, or or uh, commissioning art in the past too. So I still want to do something that's going to compromise the ability, you know, some of our funding and um, without a 
comprehensive effort. Mr. Chairman, is there any, Sean, is there any reason we can't delay this to the next meeting? And I just want to reiterate, we have a great partnership with Tanya and the arts partnership, and I want that to continue. This is for 2025, but you're talking about won't even start until 2026 when the audition is done. It's two different programs. Well, I think, I think if it's not urgent that we decide right now, I think it's good to look at this whole package, and we want it to be coordinated what we're doing. So, Well, I just want to recognize again what what John Ivy stuff is years down the road. This is they don't conflict even if we approve this. This is the gap. This is this is the gap. Nothing that Ivy's going to do is going to kick in until this is done. Okay. So there's no. Yeah, this is just a request for 2025. I mean, I suppose there's no reason we can't pass this, and Brandon knows we want this all incorporated as we go forward and come up with a coordinated. Deal. Along those lines, I'll move to approve. Well, yeah, I would no reason not to. I'd, yeah, I'd like to see a motion to uh, approve the request for the art partnership for 2025. So, okay, and is there a second? I'll second. Okay, motion been made and seconded. Discussion. Hearing none, roll call, please. Yes, Bird. Aye. 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 13, old business. Uh, one of them is the cleared channel. Yes, Mr. Chair. So um, at the last meeting of the authority, there was a pretty significant discussion about where we've been and where we're at and where we're going. So I actually had one of my staff people go and get me a transcript as to sort of the direction so I could make sure I was on the same page. And my directive was to go back and sort of give the board a picture of where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. So that's the memorandum that I included in your packet. And the end of the memorandum is basically having reached out to Thaddeus in that it's his time to then come back with another response to sort of the negotiations we've been in. And Sean and I had a phone conference with him, with Thaddeus yesterday, which I thought was very useful. And then I asked him to author the <coughs> have that I gave you this morning to outline the position that he conveyed to Sean and myself on that call. And the gist of this is Thaddeus and Clear Channel wants to work with the airport authority to come to something that works for everyone. And he outlines that in his letter. <coughs> One of the items he talks about is if the airport authority wants the sponsorships, they can have, you can have them. Um, so basically what's in his letter is what he can do to us yesterday. Um, of note is he would like to set up like a working group with Sean, Thaddeus, and at least one board member to try to figure out what the clear path <clears throat> is for both parties and, you know, what the mutually agreed looking forward looks like. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I think this is where we wanted to get to. And so I would move that, uh, that Sean and one board member work with the clear channel to fine tune what sponsorship and what's not. I would uh, I would like to appoint Sean and Dr. Bersani to that group and Thaddeus. Well, yeah. Mr. Chairman and Stacy, this takes us to your open meeting, open records. Uh, an appointed committee has to be subject to it, correct? Well, if it's only one board member, no. It's only one board meeting. Well, no, you, you, you'd said before that... Uh, if it's a subcommittee where you have two members, that creates a requirement for the open meetings, ever like advertising. I'm just I'm just checking. Uh, well, because we're having different rules here. Well, I think, Mr. Chairman, too. Whatever we've met the last two weeks, two months, we've done an open meeting thing. We've shared the notes, and we've done those things. So. Yeah. You know, as for us to go forward, we're going to have to have subcommittees. Yeah, no, I, I, so I, I completely this, agree. But I, I would say, I know, uh, you know, Paul has been very involved with this. I think, you know, I don't care who would want to do it, but I, I do think this is a step in the right direction. 
Okay, there's, and you made a motion? Well, sounds like we have. I, I would be happy to work on the committee or whatever well, else I, as I, well. I'm going to use the prerogative of chair and, and appoint Dr. Bashani, Sean, and Thaddeus to this working group. Mr. Chairman, there, there is no prerogative with the chair. It, it's a motion chair can of the appoint. board. No, it's a motion of the, of the authority. Not the motion no. was to appoint one member. Yes. But and it's not your prerogative. That well, you do need to. And I, I would I would encourage us to, to look at including Paula with it, given she's the one that spent the most time talking to potential sponsors. <clears throat> well, and I've been on uh, calls in the past and uh, identifying some of the uh, challenges that existed with the current uh, contract, et cetera, with Clear Channel. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think I think we should put two members on. I think uh, we all are involved on that committee. Otherwise, whatever the committee comes back with, it's going to take a bunch of us time or time to sort through it. So, your motion is what then? To add uh, to to go forward with this, have Sean, Paul, and Dean be part of that working group. Clear channel to define what sponsorship and what's okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Uh, yeah, and I would contend then if there's two board members, a subcommittee of two, that that's going to require notice. Yep. No, problem. no big deal. Okay. Roll call. Rashani. Abstain simply because I'm part of the Aye. I'll abstain as well. No. Motion dies. Any other rise. items to the. I just had one more. So um, there's no working committee now, so it's died. I've got one other oh, issue that's separate oh. if you want to. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I would make a motion uh, to require the abstaining votes to vote. There is no conflict or monetary or any reward to it. I can't, didn't even hear the motion. It's a motion to compel yes. them to vote. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> okay. The roll call. I, there's no second. All right, I'll second. Is there a second? Did you second? Yep, second. Okay, motion been made and seconded. Mm -hmm. Roll call, please. Shawnee. Yes. Aye. Aye. Ekman. Aye. Capitan. No. Okay, Aye. any other items? Old business. Our next meeting is September 10th. So now do we have to go back and vote and require that yeah, the that, yeah, that vote was to allow everyone to vote. So I think yeah. we have to go back and just vote on having that and committee. Oh, oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. It's the same. It's the same thing. Oh, second. Does it make this painful? No. <laughs> so I, I misunderstood them. I thought we were voting no. on to compel you to vote. No, no, not be, whether I. No, right. no, you vote. I still don't think it's appropriate, but yeah. So, is there a motion then to you have to remake the motion, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, if we're back. We'd have to reconsider that motion, but I guess I'd say let's just table this for two weeks. There's. I don't want to leave this meeting without this resolved, and apparently, I think it's okay. What's that? So, what are we doing? We have to vote on the committee formation now, and it requires you two to vote, citing no conflict. Is that how you see it, Joan? We're back at the motion. We're back at the motion because he wants to these have, two to vote yes or no. Yeah, the motion to have two people along with Sean, keep with Thaddeus. Okay, is there a second to that? But I think we're just taking that motion. That motion's already in order. We're just revoting. Okay. Roll call again, please. Johnny. Still abstain. Berg. Uh, yes. Yes. Aye. No. Okay. Motion passed. Yep. Yeah. Three, two. Three, two. Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. I had one other thing kind of under old business with uh, this whole fuel thing. I think we ought to take a look at that. And so uh, my my thinking was that if we have a hangar owner, uh, they, they may have fuel equipment subject to a criteria that we need to decide to find the board. We have done that. So 
I guess I would move that payment owners may have fuel equipment subject to criteria that this board would define. I think that'll get the discussion going. Okay, is there a second? Can you repeat that, Rick? Uh, let's see. Hangar owners may have fuel equipment subject to criteria defined by the MAA board. Second? <coughs> second. Yes. Motion's been made and seconded. Mr. Chairman, I discussion. Yeah. Are we replacing an existing policy or is this new? I, well, I don't know. Yeah, that's I what mean, I'm trying to That's why out. I think we have to have, I, from my perspective, I think this creates something where we can talk to Jet Center, we can talk with Dave, we can talk with Group 6, and have a policy that makes sense. So Yeah, and I'm just trying to understand. The history is that the Airport Authority, the Fargo Fire Department, and the Department of Health had discussions after multiple underground tanks were taken out around the airport for decades. The suggestion was was to centralize fuel farms. So there's only one area that's impacted, the fire department preferred, and the health department. So you have the Northwest Airlines fuel farm over here that Fargo Jet Center acquired. That's grandfathered in. So the North General Aviation Area was created, the fuel farm was created, and the board said this is where all fuel tanks will go. If anybody wants a fuel tank, this is where the fuel tanks will go. Well, Danny and Donnie Schatz came before the board, they're in the fuel business, wanted to bury an underground tank next to their hangar. The board did allow that because they're in the fuel business, they have the permits and licensing to haul fuel from the truck stop, the storage area, to their hangar area. The South General Aviation Area, uh, next to Hangar 19, or just on the west side, is the designated fuel farm area for the South GA. Nothing has changed. Nobody else has an underground tank over there. So, because Dave Saul installed the last available space in the South GA fuel farm, it, it's full unless, I don't know, we redesign or get the FA to waiver some type of the approach for runway 3-1, which isn't going to happen. We have to look for additional space to accommodate Mr. Arneson or, or Fargo Aircraft Maintenance. That area is full. This board can decide, do you want to expand another area to allow fuel farms? That's really the nutshell. That's as simple as you can get. They wanted them coordinated so that if there was a fuel spill or an underground leak, the health department and the fire department said, boy, this would be a great thing just to coordinate well, all the tanks. This will, get us that, this, moves this, uh, this will get us this history so, so we have something. So that's the history in a nutshell. We'll try and find it in minutes. Uh, we've got fuel tank guidelines uh, that have to follow local, state, and federal requirements. Uh, so, in a nutshell, that's what it is. Because of all the contamination that's on the airfield, because of underground tanks in the past, health department, fire department, airports, let's consolidate them into one location to isolate any future contamination. That's what it is, period. There's, it doesn't get any more complicated than that. Now that Mr. Sweeney saw there's fuel tanks per uh, proposed outside of the South G area that the board said this is where we want them, he has a concern. And without allowing an expansion of the fuel tanks, there's no other place to put tanks. Yeah, and I just think this moves that discussion forward. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So September 10th is our next meeting. I'm traveling to take a vote on that. We should vote on that motion. Yeah, it, you made the motion. Right. Is there a second? Dean yes. seconded already. Okay. It's a motion again. Um, roll call. Yes. It's a motion again. All right. Hanger owners may fuel have fuel equipment subject to criteria defined by the airport authority. Shawnee. Yes. Berg. Aye. 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 Uh, September 10th is our next meeting. I'm traveling on the 24th, so at this point it would appear to be on September. We asked Stacy and I to look at the bylaws. She did create a memo about the bylaws. Uh, we changed those at any time. The idea was to go to one meeting a month. Um, that's something that you want to enact this calendar year or start in January. I guess that's, that's your project. Uh, bylaws are discussion in October. October. Okay. Moved up to September. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll just have one meeting in September, so if you want to continue to meet on the 10th or so for the we'll have a lot of change for you for the September 10th. Okay. 
no motion required on that right now. Then. The only other thing I'll add is uh, we met with the federal security director here uh, last week at our stakeholder meeting. There are 60 positions in Fargo. Correct, 60 assigned positions that are here in Fargo. We only have 34 employees in short of that meeting. Um, most of the employees that are here are from other parts of the country. They're on parts of the country. They're traveling employees. They can't fill positions here. There's 80 some open positions with the TSA statewide. So we've been, I met with uh, Kramer and Hovind's uh, DC staffers here. They were here last week and the week before to try and convince them to work with Homeland Security to increase locality pay. That's one of the things that the FSD feels will help uh, to increase locality pay, to increase the wage. Um, Am I hearing right? This is a North Dakota issue, not a Fargo issue. Um, it's a rural state issue. Okay, Wyoming, fair South Dakota, Montana, and others, although Sioux Falls has a contractor that runs their security. So locality <laughs> is one thing to try and address it. Um, but at the same time, they're a process to hire someone. So they do have three people in training or four. Three or four people in training here. We have to ask in the office, when did you apply? It was over a year ago. They're just getting into training now. So most of the time when they call employees that say, hey, you're now in the pool, let's go for training. They say, well, we're going to the job, you know, four or five months ago. Or they don't make it through the medical. So just, just so letting you know that we have three lanes out there. So for the general public that wants and says, hey, it took a long time to get through security, they don't have the employees to run all three lanes. That, that's the problem. And it's not going to get better anytime soon. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Motion to make a second. Meeting adjourned. <coughs>